Welcome to the Policy and Regulatory Committee for June. Uh, one, two, three, four. So we have our quorum present today. Um, and, and just before we start, um, Councillor Reid um, may find it necessary to leave us briefly um, via a phone call if need be. Um, in which case we'll take a brief adjournment because it'll take us down below the quorum. Um, so we'll get started. Are there any apologies for today, please? So we've got Councillors McDonnell, uh, Richard McDonnell, and um, who was the other? Richard McPhail. Richard McPhail. Thank you. Uh, can I have a move that they be accepted, please? So that's uh, Councillor Dixon, Councillor McKenzie second. Thank you. First item in the agenda is the Regulatory Services Report. Um, I trust that everyone has read the report that's on pages one to three. Are there any questions of the author? Mrs. Shepherd? Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just regarding the litter, I see that we've got quite a large amount of litter being dumped, which is a little bit of a concern. Does Francis see that as growing, or how can we mitigate that? And, and as part of the same question, I guess, so far this year to the end of June, um, there's been 39 complaints in the year. It compares to 27 last year, 42 the year before, and 29 the year before, so it seems to go up and down. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so there's all sorts of things that come out. Sorry, that gets listed as litter. Um, they fluctuate. They go up and down a little bit, like abandoned vehicles. Sometimes an abandoned vehicle will be reported, but it's somebody who's parked a car outside a house for three days. Um, so it's, it's pretty hard to gauge, but it, it I, yeah. It's, no, no, no. Sometimes we have nothing, and then sometimes we might get three in a day, and we'll get nothing for six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks. It's varied, but I don't see a significant increase at this point. Thank you. I note too that the number of um, seizures for noise control uh, seems to be very low this year compared to other years. Is that person related or just less, you know, the, the way the team's working or just less complaints? Um, I think it's less complaints and um, there's also, there definitely is less complaints and I think the economic climate and money has a lot to do with it. People don't appear to be partying like they were, but now that we've said that, um, it's Murphy's Law will probably increase. Even our contractor has noted that there's been a significant decrease in the number of calls that they're receiving. Thank you. Any other questions, comment? Councillor McKenzie? Francis, just wondering um, what happens with abandoned vehicles, etc. the investigation is to try and track down who the owners are. Just wondering what the processes are there. So we will do a registration check and um, that will give us the owner's details. We will try and find a phone number. Um, we will ring them. Um, sometimes we get one. We had one just a week, a week or so ago that had no plates, no nothing. Um, completely trashed, just dumped on the side of the road. Um, unfortunately, there's the odd one that we do have to just pick up and remove. Um, but where we can, we do track them down and um, get them shifted by the owners. Thank you. Any other feedback, Councillor Dixon? Thank you, Mr Chair. I was just wondering, um, just discussing stock and poultry, there has been a few people have commented to me about people keeping more hens on their property at present because of a shortage of eggs. Um, do we see any, has there been many complaints 
regarding hint? No. Roosters, occasionally. Um, but there definitely has been an increase in people keeping hens, but the bylaw allows you to keep up to 10 head of poultry without a permit. But we do, if we get any complaints, um, our animal team goes and has a wee chat to them and we just work with them. So, but there hasn't been a significant increase in complaints. Um, Thank you, Francis. Any other queries? I'll move that the uh, information be received. Can I have a seconder, please? Uh, it will need to come from a committee member. <laughs> uh, Councillor Reid, thank you. But do well, uh, I welcome you, uh, Councillor Stringer, to this meeting. Yes, fine, thank you. Right, I, item two is the report on the building control activities that goes into a fair bit of detail. So that's on pages four to 10 of the agenda. Are there any questions that arise from that? Well, they're looking at it, uh, Russell Patterson's the author. Um, so with, with the BWAF audits, um, there's some uncertainty over what is legally required. Is, is someone somewhere going to get some clarification? Uh, through you, Mr Chairman. Um, I think it's now case in point with the recent Loafers Lodge um, episode that happened in Wellington, a tragic event. Um, now, MB are more and more um, getting more forceful with their guidance. Um, even though it is guidance, it is deemed to be the, 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 the heritage that you're supposed to follow now. Um, it's not specifically in the Building Act that you must go and do audits. However, one of the sections under Section 111, which I've got on there, their intention is that TAs will conduct, um, take all reasonable steps and that's what they consider as all reasonable steps. That rather than just receive the annual um, building warrant of fitnesses that, that, um, that the owners are, are deemed to supply to council, and we do a desktop check of it, um, we are now deemed to go out and do a percentage per year, especially of the high risk buildings. So is it necessary to have a fee associated with those? How do we recover costs? Yes, um, we already have a fee in the fee schedule. Uh, it was built in about two to three years ago, um, but we haven't actively been doing audits, although we did do 70 audits in the 2021 year uh, when we had a previous compliance officer, and now we're up to speed again with our new compliance officer. We're going to start rolling them out, um, and they'll be invoiced for them. The annual certificates that comes in, who prepares those? Um, they're normally prepared by an IQP company, which is an independently qualified person company, on behalf of the owners, it's the owner's responsibility to supply the annual building, building warrant of fitness, but they generally delegate that to a, um, to a company to do that on their behalf. So is, is what the Crown saying that they don't necessarily accept the quality of what these people are submitting? I think what they're saying is that they want councils to go out and do an audit, that the IQPs are actually doing the job when they go on the site, um, we've had recent cases in Gore where IQPs have been found they haven't been doing their job correctly and there's been a couple of issues being exposed when the IQP company changed recently. So we're following up on those to get them correct. Any, any other questions? Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr Chair. Just for clarification for the public, I presume uh, BWAF is a building warrant of fitness. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, just on that point, it's good to see that the um, consents are pretty much within the timeframes that they're supposed to be. So, always positive for the tradies. Um, through the Chair, yes, consents, we're getting back to uh, timeframes are getting better. Um, the peak is certainly gone. In actual fact, the, um, if you saw our um, um, chart at the moment, you would see for June the consents on the door has actually plummeted. Um, so we've seen in June. Um, we're thinking it's going to be a short-term thing, but we're just not 100% not sure. Um, so we had a peak in May of what was issued. Now we've got a, a, a decline. Councillor Stringer. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, do we have any numbers of consents that have lapsed? Sorry. Sorry. Oh, 
um, through the chair, no, we probably don't have that as a as a figure there, but we can find that out. Um, over a, <laughs> all right. Over, over what sort of period are you looking at? Uh, well, it's, um, I, think, I think they're issued for a year, so over that year period, if, uh, outside that year period, like what ones haven't been acted upon because obviously you're going around doing your code of compliance on the on the um, on the certificate or consent to say that it's been done. It's what ones haven't followed through and done the work and have just let it lapse. Sure. There's, just to clarify that, this lapsing is actually work that doesn't start within 12 months, um, and then if it gets to the 24 months period and the work's not completed, it's at that point that we refuse to issue the code of compliance certificate. So that's the difference between that and lapsing. But yeah. yeah. yeah this one, yeah okay. Hope we can find that. Any, any other questions? How how many? Temporary accommodation providers do we have other than motels? Through you, Mr. Chair, we did a we did a, um, a group check last week and we've come up with 29 in total, 29 buildings that we feel would have um, some sort of accommodation. Now that's talking likes of St Peter's Hostel, motels, um, Croydon Lodge. Um, you know, backpackers, flats, those sort of things that are that are more than just residential accommodation. So we come up with a, a figure of 29 buildings, and that's probably quite high. There might be a couple of weed out of there. So does that include the um, people provided accommodation through the different websites that are available? No, no, no. That's nothing to do with Airbnb or anything like that because they potentially aren't an accommodation provider under the Building Act until they go through a change of use. In, in your report, you also referred to um, uh, the file destruction option and, and highlighted some things that, that might need to be done. Are you wanting some feedback from the committee on that? Um, through you, Mr Chair, um, I really just highlighted that because um, I think council as a whole has been a little bit reluctant to to destroy hard copy files. Um, they've been squirrelled away, stored in Auckland, I believe, still by the company that scanned the hard the files initially. Um, and without any formal, um, what would you say, a process, um, I, I believe our IT people have been going through the process, and it's got to go to Archives New Zealand to get formal approval to to destruct any hard copy files. So that's between um, Chief Executive and IT to progress that and then head it on to Heritage New Zealand. Right, so there's nothing required from us? No, I don't think no. so. All right, any, any other questions? So can I have a mover that report be accepted, please? Councillor Reid, seconded uh, Councillor Dixon, thank you. Mm. Item three, pages 11 to 23 is the housing and business uh, capacity uh, report, which um, Katrina is the author. And um, so what, what you've described is that there's a statutory requirement to prepare a report um, and leave it to the district plan review. Is that a fair summary? <laughs> Uh, yes, though the requirement to provide this report is annually, so it won't always align with the district plan review, but at this point of time, the district plan review will create the additional capacity required to meet um, Gore District's demand requirements, capacity requirements. So do we have any questions in terms of what's in the report, please? It contains a fair bit of data and other stuff that I guess will be feed will feed into the long-term plan process. Um, so from that point of view, it's very useful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dixon, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, just in terms of rental affordability, I see the rental affordability for Gore is really dropped well back compared with the rest of New Zealand. Is that um, regards to financial hardship maybe, or the rents have risen dramatically in this district? Okay. Um, that's just due to the 
price of rents is the data that we're capturing to put in this report as opposed to the reasons why they've increased. Statistics are not looking particularly good, are they really, for gore rental accommodation? Yeah, correct. It's showing that there's an affordability issue or issue. The, um, the affordability of rentals is getting worse. Yes. Thank you, Katrina. The report also refers to a need for social housing. Does that take into account the um, um, project that's underway in East Gore, or is that just a short-term fix? Um, are you talking about the Kainga Ora project? Mm. So this data is based on um, who is registered with the ministry and also consents that are issued. So because that resource consent application is lodged but not issued, it hasn't been taken into account in terms of houses provided. Okay, any, any other questions arising from that report? If not, can I have a, a mover that it be accepted, please? Councillor Dixon, seconded. I'll oh, second it. Thank you. Uh, report number four, District Plan Notification and Section 32 report, which is on page 24, um, which is one of those technical steps as part of the District Plan review. Do you want to just simplify it for us, please, Katrina? Yes, sure. So um, with district plan reviews, you're essentially looking at the effectiveness and efficiency of your current district plan, looking at what other issues and options are out there and uh, working out what your needs of the district are and updating the plan accordingly. Um, in the background behind that is what's called the Section 32 reports, which is Section 32 of the Resource Management Act, and those are kind of the beefy planning technical reports that have all the cost-benefit analysis, what the issues and options are, why you've landed on certain options, what technical input you got, what community and stakeholder feedback you got, what monofenoma feedback you got, etc. So it's kind of the report just capturing everything in terms of the technical analysis um, behind the provisions. So we've already gone to the district plan subcommittee numerous times where we've talked about the various issues and options and outcomes. Um, so this is the, the report that will sit behind all of those um, outcomes. So your suggestion is that from an efficiency point of view that I have the delegation to um, sign that off prior to final approval by council? Yes, that was discussed at the previous district plan subcommittee report, um, and I think there was a, a willingness to that because this is going to be about a thousand pages of technical planning information, um, and it might be more efficient for one person to be across it. Councillors won't be let off the hook, however, it will appear on the council hub, and you will have an opportunity of reading it as, as much as you like. But as Katrina highlighted, it is a, a, a technical report, and I'm in a position. Uh, it's not necessarily a quality, well, it is in part a quality control, but it's really to make sure all the boxes have been ticked. It's not signing off saying, hey, um, that's, that's good, that's not good. Um, so it's a process that submitters will have an opportunity of commenting on it as well. So the hearing committee. Um, when it's set up, we'll have the task of going through the report again. Or well, 1,000 pages, you say. Any questions from the committee? Councillor, there's only one of you today, Linus Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, are there any legal or um, insurance requirements around your appointment? Because what concerns me a little is that you were involved in the district plan in the early stages before handing over to Property Group. Um, is there perceived or real perceptions of conflict there? Um, no, there isn't, and, and, and it's an issue that came up in my uh, commissioner recertification, and, and I guess I haven't reported back to the committee, but after um, roughly 80 hours of doing assignments and, and a one-day um, teams meeting, I've now been recertified as a hearing commissioner for the next five years with the chair in endorsement. 
And one of the issues that came up as part of that process was people in the situation I've been in. And similarly for councillors who are involved in the preparation of the plan, um, requires one set of considerations when you're preparing a plan and another set when you're actually sitting there as a commissioner considering submissions. And in this case, looking at the section 32 report. So I guess in, in the case of the section 32 report, it's using my knowledge and skill set to streamline the process as it were, rather than having to go through a series of reports that look at it in far more detail. So it is time and cost efficient to do it that way. Any other questions? All right, can I have a mover that both the report be received and that the review and authorisation of the release of the Section 32 reports um, be delegated to Keith Hovell? Councillor Reid, seconded by Councillor Dixon. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, carried. Leads us on to item five, which is the resource consent update. Lots of numbers, lots of reporting, things are, are proceeding on time. Are there any questions that arise from that? It's on pages 25 to 30 of the agenda. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, just once again, good result with those consents. Um, but query, um, building coverage breach for the uninitiated, is that too close to the boundary? Or could you... Um, that way. Somebody, where? Oh, sorry, big pardon. <laughs> Been a long day. Um, could you just give me some indication of how that actually works, please? Yes, sure. So a building coverage breach is, um, so depending on the zone, there's certain rules about the total building size or percentage of the site you're allowed to build over. Um, I just need to find the exact consent reference that you're referring to here. Oh, yeah. So... Um, I don't have that full consent in front of me, but essentially um, somebody might be allowed to build, say, like 200 metres squared, and they might have built 250 metres squared on their site. So there's an assessment where you consider your neighbours' amenities, stormwater effects, um, those sort of factors that might be issues that result from that increased coverage. Any other questions? Councillor McKenzie. Just on a similar vein, could that also be being building slightly in the wrong location, too close to a boundary or something like that. So that would be referenced as a setback okay. breach. Thank you. Previously, um, we talked about having copies of the consents and the decisions available on the council's website. How's that progressing? Um, yes, yeah, sure, I remember that being raised. What we're planning to do is have consents go on the website for any consents that are lodged in the new financial year, being from 1st of July, so we'll have a process kick in from then, and then, because it's a bit of a manual process, um, due to not having software that automatically populates into a public portal here, but we can get every consent decision online, um, so starting from consents issued from the 1st of July. Right, so members of the public wanting to know what's in the consent will be able to go online and have a look and see what the decision is as well. Thank you. Any other questions? So I'll, I'll move the report be received. Uh, sorry, Councillor Reid. Councillor Havel, hang on. Um, <laughs> just a question once again, um, and just because I really don't know the answer to this, uh, and somebody asked me, when Waka Katohi um, have that building site in East Gore, they have to go through the normal consent processes at Gore District Council? Or because they're a, a government department, does that preclude any of that? Um, so it depends. So Wakakata here, what's called a requiring authority, and student like Gore District Council's requiring authority as well. There's certain government departments, councils, and infrastructure providers that can go through a process of getting a designation. And then um, if you're doing any works in your designation, you don't have to abide by the district plan rules, but you have to abide by the conditions of your designation. And you come in for what's called an outline plan of work. So you still tell the council what you're doing and get an approval for that. So it depends on if the site's designated or not, but the State Highway Network tends to be designated and go through that process. 
It's through the chair, if I may add, I'm not sure whether your question was regarding building consents as well. Because um, Kiora or Waka Katahi um, have their own building control authority called Consentium, and we're not yet aware whether Consentium are going to be doing the building consents for the site or whether we're going to see the building consent applications. Um, we've asked several times, but we're not getting a straight answer. So, Thank you, Russell. Um, actually, that's possibly the question that was posed to me um, along those lines is, you know, how does that work mm. when they're building in our district? But, mm. Right, are we out of questions this time? So can I have a mover and a seconder then? Uh, a mover, please. Uh, Councillor Dixon, and I'll second it just to spread it around, that the report be accepted. All those in favour say aye, against, carried. Takes us on to report number six, which is on pages 31 to 37 from Morgan, uh, looking at the list of policies that, that he's um, looking at um, and, and setting out some priorities there in the report. Are there any questions of Morgan? Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr Chair. I see that the election signs review um, policy is in December of this year, after the general election. <laughs> Can we bump it to the top of the list? <laughs> if, if, if I may help. Yep. Council has previously indicated that that policy will be in abeyance so that um, uh, the, um, uh, it won't apply to the national elections this year. And, and the reason for that is and it's dealt with in Morgan's report, he says um, the, the policy states that it will be reviewed after each election. And the ones that we had last year was the first election to be held since the policy came into, um, in, into effect. So now is the time for the first looking at it. However, the, the issue that really arises is do we need the policy Given that there was non-compliance that I observed, and, and, and um, um, uh, Francis will be able to highlight whether there are any complaints received, um, I noticed some non-compliance of, of the signs. I also noted that uh, the strict requirements of the signs in the rural area requires huge signs, yet uh, there's a welcome sign to Gore as you come into Gore that doesn't comply with the lettering size, but is perfectly readable. So what that pointed to me was that the requirements that we've got in the policy are probably over the top. Um, and so there's a couple of questions that need to be looked at as part of any review. Do we need the policy? Uh, what should be in the policy? How does it compare to what's in the district plan? Because there's some rules in the district plan um, and in the proposed plan. And do we need a bylaw? So rather than coming back with a straight, let's update the policy, I think there's another process that we need to go through first. I don't know if you want to comment on that at all, Morgan? Uh, through the chair, uh, I, I couldn't add anything more. <laughs> yeah. So we did it as a policy first up, um, just to try to see how it, how it went and need to go back from first principles rather than bring it in December. Any other questions coming up in that report? Yes, yes Councillor McKenzie. Uh, just, it's, it's, it's pretty much a comment. I was approached by a political party person last election, um, and they said, do you have certain areas that are set aside for said notices? And I knew nothing at the time. Well, I still know nothing, but... Um, they thought they, because they did come into council, they told me these folk, and they thought they had permission to put signs up, but when they put them up, they had to take them down again because uh, maybe it wasn't made clear that they were going to be political signs. I really don't know. But my, my main question is, do, do we actually have certain areas that are set aside for those signs, especially at election time? Are any of the staff able to comment before I give my sixpence worth? All right, like many councils have areas where um, election signs are allowed to be set up and it'll be um, some green spaces somewhere, it'll be corners um, where, where all the signs can be put together. Uh, the Gore District doesn't have that and I think as part of the consideration moving forward, it's something that we need to think about. 
Um, there were some um, signs that were put up at the last, last um, uh, national elections and the senior planner at the time uh, took steps to have them removed, is my memory of, of what happened. Um, there was also, also need to be aware that um, there's national legislation that applies to the national elections. Um, so it's the electioneering something or another um, that sets out the size of signs um, and the um, details that go on them. Um, but it does have a rider saying that if there's requirements in the council's district plan, then that applies. Now, the only requirements that I can see in the proposed district plan um, probably need to be a little tweaked, and I'll come back to the consultants on that. So any other comment arising from that part of the signs? Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'm just observing that there is nowhere in Gore that people can actually place their signs on any reserve or any area. I think it would be quite wise to look at that as well. Yes. To give yeah, everyone yeah. a fair opportunity. Now, the other, the other item is in your paragraph 3.3, um, you um, referred to the financial contributions and industrial and commercial development contributions disbursement policies. Now, at the previous meeting of assets and infrastructure, there was a report put up in relation to that from our planning consultants where the recommendation was that we proceed with a development contribution policy and that it be dealt with as part of the long-term plan, but the consideration of the drafts and working through the issues will come to this committee. So while it's one that's gonna end up on the list of things to be done, the consultants will be working on it as the good news from your point of view. The other one, I, I guess, is uh, 3.9, the um, roading stopping policy. Um, I can't recall where it comes up at the end. Um, that policy actually makes reference to what's in the current district plan. So just to note for your info that that'll need to be looked at. So are there any other questions, comments, et cetera, coming up from that report? Uh, Councillor Dixon. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. Regarding 3.2, the community grants policy, um, having the LTP and the annual plan in mind um, and our rates, predicted rate rise, and seeing that we have um, a very high community grants um, programme, which is quite a lot higher than other councils, I think it is a good opportunity to have a closer look at this. I know 452,000, which is very generous, and I know it does a lot of community good, but um, in comparison, Waitaki District Council has only 75,000 in their community grant, so I think it is something that needs to be looked at, maybe by the Community Wellbeing Committee. And, and given that's 2% of the annual rates paid by people, um, I would agree with you. So does that require a recommendation or um, from this committee? I think that would be wise that we, that we do. I see that it's going to be reviewed in October. Maybe it could be reviewed um, before that. How often are the community grants done? Sorry? How often do the grants take place? Is it done as an annual event? Well, we haven't actually reviewed it in the last year. But the actual year. paying of the grants, when does that happen? Annually. I believe it's annually. And haven't we just done it? No. Uh, just through the chair, that will go through as part of the annual plan um, in terms of the... Um, the grants through there, but that I think this is an opportunity for the policy to be developed uh, alongside 
the long-term plan process. Um, I don't think the, needs to be, the policy needs to be 100% in place for you to look at um, community grants in the interim and what the approach may be um, through, through your long-term plan process. So I guess what you're saying is the policy is the process, the detail of who gets what is uh, an annual plan, long-term plan yes. matter. Excellent. Councillor Stringer. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I believe we've had discussion in the LTP sessions about um, setting a budget on grants, um, so I think that would be part of the process as well. Councillor Reid. Um, I also note that um, one or two organisations already have decided that they don't require um, their grants from Council. Uh, some of them have been... Um, have received very generous government grants through the COVID period, which seems to be tiding them over. And um, I know of at least one of them who's come back to council and said they no longer require our grant, which I think is a really um, very admirable situation. So, Councillor Dixon, in terms of the community grants policy is currently set down uh, then for consideration in October. Um, what outcome do you want at this stage? Thank you, Mr Chair. I think at this stage, since we're looking at in October, which isn't too far in, in the distant future, and it is part of the long-term plan, um, and most of them have probably been, most of the grants have probably been paid out um, this term, I think October for a review of that is, is fine. Okay, thank you. Um, the dust suppression policy um, seems to be quite um, prescriptive in that um, it, it refers to um, council paying half, it has a dollar amount in there, and says uh, 100 metres shall be sealed. And I would have thought in the case of some houses, 30 metres might be enough. Um, so I guess as part of the review, there's a, there's a need to look at the rationale behind it, what the effect is, um, and its amenity as well as health type issues um, from dust. Um, so just, just as an observation. All right, any other questions and comments? So we have a, a recommendation that's on page 37 uh, that the report be received and the council note and endorse the following order of priority and the, and the policies are, are setting out there. Uh, can I have a mover for those recommendations, please? Councillor Reid, a seconder. Councillor McKenzie, thank you. And all those in favour say aye. All against, carried. Thank you. Item seven, dangerous and or insanitary buildings policy review. How, and, and Russell Patterson is the author of that. How, how significant, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, comes, it flows between the two of you, I hope. Um, how, how significant is this policy in Gore? Is it an issue? Through you, Mr Chair, um, as you'll note in the report, there are six buildings uh, with heritage grade one or two listing. Uh, from that, uh, you can uh, infer that perhaps the policy isn't as important as others, for instance, perhaps the community grants policy. Um, but there are two things to note here. One, uh, those buildings form a significant, or some of them, form a significant component of Gore's regional identity. Uh, one such building is the Sergeant Dan building, uh, which, if memory serves, won the Hokanui, uh, Hokanui sorry, I'm still thinking of Hokanui Gold, um, Radio Hokanui um, Facebook poll for most iconic landmark in Gore. Um, and the second one is that it is legislated by law, that the dangerous and insensitive will debt there be um, and dangerous and or insanitary buildings policy uh, and that it deals to um, 
how the policy applies to heritage buildings. So the key part of what's in your report is that at present um, the policy doesn't apply to heritage buildings. A uh, simple two-page policy. Are there any questions or comments that, from the committee, please, Councillor McKenzie? Just talking about that particular building, that chimney, <laughs> it affects a couple of people in this room. How is it monitored for safety? Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. At current, um, they've been asked to supply an a, um, a engineer's report for that building, which includes the chimney, and I don't think we have one supplied yet. Um, so that is in the process at the moment. But when you say monitoring, um, there's no formal monitoring by us until we get a, a complaint otherwise to say that one of your buildings underneath there could be classed as a dangerous building because of what's above you. So that's where the dangerous building policy clicks into place. Any other, uh, Councillor Reid? Um, just for a wee bit of clarification around that, Russell. Does that, um, because if that chimney fell, um, it would block the access for emergency vehicles in the case of uh, earthquakes? Would that be another issue? Um, through you, Mr Chair, I don't think that would be the case for that building. It's more likely endangering the um, occupants of buildings directly in its path, more so than falling onto the street. Mm. I have had it said that from people with um, first responders that that would be an issue for them was if the streets were blocked in case of an earthquake. Yes, potentially. There are, there are other routes, though. Um, there are other routes that you could get around if that street, for example, was blocked. But, yeah. Right. So would that preclude... Well, if, that, if that's the case, if there are other routes, does that mean that... Um, how does that affect the earthquake standard? Well, all, all of those buildings within that precinct are part of the priority buildings area, which mm -hmm. we have maps for the Gore and Matera that come in front of council about three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, for the priority areas. All of those ones have been mapped now and either sent letters and we've had earthquake reports for them or earthquake reports due for those buildings in that area. Mm. I think all, all building owners would have received uh, a letter mm -hmm. by now to furnish a report. Um, so obviously they're called a priority area because um, they're within that um, landscape within Gore or Matera that can be accessed by not only vehicle traffic, but foot traffic. Um, so that's, wh that's where it comes down to that whole priority area. And then once they're done, it goes out to the wider, wider landscape of any other building that's possibly earthquake prone. Councillor Stringer. Uh, through you, Mr Chair to Russell. Um, yeah, as you're aware, my business sits right underneath said chimney. Um, and I know the building I'm in is well below the 20% uh, MBS. Um, now, what I'm just wanting to clarify is with this um, dangerous buildings, what takes precedence? Dangerous buildings or does the heritage listing take precedence? Because <laughs> in some of these cases, the, the cost, like I know, I know the cost that's going to take to bring the building on and up to code, and it's literally walk away. Um, what takes precedence? Because eventually, if, if we walk away, we've spent money doing this building up to a standard where we can work in it. If we walk away, where does that leave? Because then it becomes derelict, it's going to run down further, and we're, we're into a sort of cycle. Mm. Through the chair, I'm not sure I can answer. Um, because <laughs> ideally, at the moment, we don't have any heritage included in our dangerous and, and sanitary <laughs> policy. Um, however, when it is included and endorsed, I'm not just sure what the preference is. Um, I, can't, I can't answer that in, in um, black and white. Sorry. Yeah. Councillor Reid, sorry. Um. Sorry, but is this possibly a conflict of interest that we're discussing? I think we're getting um, Although if we did it in general terms, then it wouldn't be. I think the question in terms of where does the priority lie in terms of the Building Act versus um, the heritage values. 
and, and, and that is the predicament that hearing commissioners find themselves in when there is a request um, to demolish a heritage building and, and the key argument put forward is in relation to cost. I don't know if our planning consultant sitting over there wants to add any further um, comment, but um, yeah. Um, in developing the heritage provisions for the proposed district plan, we were mindful of this and have tried to um, provide a permissive framework where it's works associated with strengthening, um, just to avoid that conflict. And I guess what flows from that is um, what um, Morgan has at paragraph 4.4 .4 of the report, um, which is on page 40, where you talk about the proposed amendment. Is this your proposed amendment? Uh, through the Chair, yes it is. It takes influence from uh, Hiranui District Council, uh, being of a similar size um, district population-wise to the Gore Council, it serves as a useful precedent. Um, yeah. And, and so you're wanting us to endorse what you've got there under the heading 3.4. Uh, are there any comments or feedback that committee members want to give? If I may, uh, yes. excuse me, Mr Chair, through you, um, because the Building Act stipulates that this must be amended through the special consultative yes. procedure. Yes. Yeah, I'm aware um, of that. Yeah. Yes. So, so your report says um, you want us to endorse it so it can go to full council. Yes, right. correct. Yes. Um, it does need an addition to it. And, and the addition would read something to the effect of um, the provisions of the Gore District Plan also apply and it may be necessary to obtain a resource consent for any work undertaken. Through the Chair, duly noted. So, uh, any other queries coming from councillors, please? None. So, if we move to the recommendation that is on page 41, uh, the report be received and that it, it endorses an amendment as set out, uh, or sorry, endorses an amendment to the policy and that, so it would be the committee note that a draft document that fulfils the requirements uh, will be presented to the council at its meeting on the 11th of July as set out in paragraph 4.4 um, of the report with the addition that I have given. So can I have a mover of all three of those, please? Councillor Dixon, seconder. Councillor Reid. All those in favour say aye. Carried. Which moves us on to the Gambling Economic and Social Review Policy, item 8, on pages 44 to 51. Are there any comments or feedback that uh, committee members want to give to Morgan on this. So it's really an update, isn't it? Mm. Councillor Reid. Just a comment. Um, it's quite good to see that drop off in the machines that are actually functioning. Um, and I guess um, one of the big worries going forward is the online gaming and mm. some of the young ones getting into the, um, the being Luke, yeah, and also you've obviously watched the same programme. Um, but also that channelling of what they're actually watching um, that's actually leading them into online gambling, not only here but overseas, and there's no rest um, restrictions or anything on that. And some of them are very, very young that are doing that. That's out of our control, obviously. And I see that um, the government is actually looking at bringing in some whatever some sort of controls, but how and what they are, who knows. Any other feedback, comments? Councillor Dixon? Um, yes, I, <coughs> I agree with um, Councillor Reid. And the other thing that I'd add to that too is that it, the online gambling of people doesn't help our community where some of not, I'm not encouraging gambling in Gore, but what I'm saying is that there is spin-offs for the community from, from gambling, and none of that happens when people are doing this online. Do, do you think that 
we as a council have a role beyond just controlling the number of machines, particularly through your community wellbeing committee? That is a very real possibility, yes. So I'm wondering if the staff um, are able to provide any comment in terms of if the council wanted to respond to what is clearly a social issue, what avenues are open to us? Any of the staff able to give us any feedback on that? Or is that something we need to consider when it comes up to um, full council? Because if we're looking at the full well-beings that the council is responsible for, um, surely, surely there's an issue here that we should be exploring. Councillor Reid. <laughs> so I'll just flag that for the, the staff to consider before it comes to the council um, at the next meeting. Unless, uh, please. Uh, Sort of, excuse me, I'm just trying to cast my mind back a couple of years when I last did a gambling uh, policy, but th th there is a lot of legislation that um, surrounds us and a lot of it has led from a, a national approach. Obviously, there's always a role to support um, our communities in terms of these issues, but um, I'm trying to think. That's, I guess that's effectively the, the role that you're looking at here and considering through this policy is whether or not um, how how much restriction you want to put on um, this policy as to whether you allow um, uh, limits on the number of gaming machines, um, or whether you allow um, new ones, or whether as you have a phase out. So it's, it's those parts of the policies where you're undertaking your role as local council to uh, mitigate the social effects um, on our communities. And that's, I think, where we see that role. There's obviously other spin-offs from that in terms of um, community impact and how we can support people that are struggling with um, issues such as gambling addiction and things like that. But there's, that's, I guess, in a nutshell, the, the purpose of this, this policy and the legislation. Just through the Francis. chair. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's absolutely correct, Jason. Um, and I know that we do have a sinking lid policy on the gambling um, machines themselves, and that's possibly um, why that drop is quite as dramatic as it is. Thank you. Francis, were you going to say something? Through you, Mr Chair, yes, um, Councillor Reid, we do have a sinking league policy, but we also, I think it includes a non-relocation. So um, if a business was to close or relocate, they can't take um, the machines with them to another site. So, um, yeah. Thank you. All right, any other, uh, Councillor um, Stringer? Uh, yeah, through you, Mr Chair. Um, can we ascertain from the values seen through here how much of that might be um, gangs um, smurfing money through the machine? So what they do is they put money in. Of course, you, there's a percentage that comes back. And they know they lose out, but they're actually getting cleaned money back. Can, do we know that, or is that a higher up the food chain? Yeah, yeah I, I think that's higher up the food chain in terms of um, uh, a police issue. All right, so we have a, a recommendation the report be received. Can I have a, a mover for that, please? Count, <laughs> Councillor McKenzie. <laughs> Councillor Reid was moving her pen, so I talk that as um, a, a yes, yes, <laughs> spreading it around. Uh, so all those in favour say aye. Against, carried. Item nine, the Climate Change Working Group update. Um, so there's some work happening behind the scenes, um, in, including um, a, uh, which is set out on pages 52 to 74, an application being made to the government for roughly 400,000 for um, Otago and Southland to work together to look at some of these issues. Um, I guess the question um, that might flow, I'll come back to in a moment, but are there any comments or questions from councillors? with regard to that report. Councillor Dixon. 
I do have a query. Is is the climate change um, interagency group, is that going to be any cost to Gore District Council? Because I see there's 500 and something thousand provided from council. Is that Environment Southland? Uh, through the chair, um, from in terms of uh, Gordon District Council's role, it's not a financial commitment being sought from Environment Southland. Um, it's, a, I guess, a, a commitment in kind to support that through um, potentially some, I guess, input through resourcing, but it's not a, a, a requirement to support it financially um, to this application. However, um, the uh, impacts um, of climate change are certainly going to be something this council needs to look at in terms of um, its long-term plan, um, how we look to mitigate some of those effects. Um, and I guess that's one of the reasons for this application is to look at, there's a, a funding opportunity there um, through central government to get some funds to look at nature-based solutions that may provide some sort of mitigation relief for um, the Gore District, and so um, Environment Southland is just seeking a, um, uh, at this stage, a support from the Gore District Council to put that application in um, and, and see if we can um, gather some funding to, to work on that. Enlighten me, please, as to what nature based solutions for flood mitigation include. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> um, I can't give you the full detail and spectrum of nature-based solutions, but I mean, it's, um, it could be a number of different factors. So it could be looking at um, one that has been discussed and that we have seen is, um, it could be like upstream um, uh, opportunities to put water out over a, a, a farmland or a, an area to reduce mitigation downstream. Um, it, it, could be a number of different factors that um, could be utilised in term, and particularly where this application I think is initially heading is um, being able to create um, detailed modelling that looks at different flows and where those potential breaches in our um, flood mitigation systems are currently and then what the impacts of those are. Um, knowing that you know, sort of through the 2020 floods, we had um, 2,400 cumex, I think, um, and so you know, that was knocking on the, the door of the Gore Bridge. Um, so we, um, with the impact of climate change and the increase in um, intensity and high rainfall events, um, it's not a matter of if, but when we get enough to breach our stop banks. And so at the moment, we can only, and going forward, we can only build stop banks so high. Um, so we need to look at other opportunities to uh, potentially deal with some of the um, increasing flows to offset the potential impacts on our um, highly, highly, higher populated areas. And so that's what Environment Southland's keen to investigate. So I guess what that's pointing to, how to slow the water down or divert it elsewhere, so wetlands, um, spillover areas, um, I guess like the flood-free area on the Tyree. Um, all right, thank you. Any, any other questions arising? The, um, on page, so what you're wanting then, uh, Jason, from that is that um, I guess we just acknowledge the work that's happening uh, at, at the regional level here and, and um, wanting us to endorse and recommend to council that, that we be an active participant in, in the work that's being done. At page um, 65, um, which sets out the um, application that's being made, if I can just bring that up. Um, it talks about developing a climate adaptation community of learning. Any, any understanding of what that means? I'd have to, sorry, through you, the Chair. Um, I'd have to investigate that and come back to you. One um, just caveat I will put on this application is that the window for this to be developed was very 
small. Um, and so uh, the Environment Southland has been working with MFE to try and extend um, the date, and this application has been changing. So I will make sure that um, when this goes to Council for further consideration that the most recent version of this application is is available as well, just to um, to check off that. But I can uh, provide some commentary at that time to around just uh, any other pieces of the application that might need um, explanation. And, and there is no doubt amongst all of us that are here, both elected representatives and everyone else, that uh, the, the river is our largest risk in terms of natural hazards and, and very obvious at that. And I'm sure the committee fully endorse uh, um, our involvement in that as um, set out in the recommendation. So can I have a mover and a seconder for the recommendations that are on page 53 and we'll deal with them all together. So Councillor Reid is a mover, Councillor uh, Dixon a seconder. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against carried. That brings us to the end of the agenda, but just before we finish, I just wanted to note that last week government announced some changes that it will be making with regard to the planting of forestry and putting um, some control back in the hands of, of council and we look forward um, to receiving a report once government has firmed up on that um, because in this, this part of the country we recognise that the current regime in the National Environmental Standard is not fit for purpose. Um, so just to highlight something that will be coming up at a future meeting. Uh, there being nothing else, I'll close the meeting. Thank you for attending, uh, for the staff and, and to